Well, I'll tell you, I've, I've really enjoyed this study that we've been doing of 1 Peter. We're in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, the last uh, six or seven verses this morning, so you could be uh, turning there. But uh, just as we've been working through it, we were reminded of the richness of our salvation in, in chapter 1 and uh, encouragement to, to live a godly and a holy life. We've talked about relationships uh, with one another. We've talked about relationships employer to employee. We've talked about husbands and wives. Uh, we've talked a lot about suffering, and it's, a, it's one of the themes of the book of First Peter. And he's uh, in wanting to, I believe, to encourage believers. I think that was a um, suffering for their faith was a, was a reality that believers faced every day uh, during that time, and so he was wanting to encourage them. Um, but as we've gone through it, it's also increased my gratitude uh, for what Jesus did for us as he suffered and died for us. Um, we've been encouraged to stand fast. Uh, we've been encouraged to do what is right no matter what. Uh, the, we we've, were challenged with what will we do with the rest of our time? Will we live for human pleasures or for the will of God? And so I hope that these have encouraged you. Maybe it's uh, shaping your perspective a little bit. I know that's what it's done uh, for me. Uh, but I'll just be honest. When I, when I got to this passage and was working through it this week, I was like, okay, Lord, another passage on suffering? Like we've been, we've been talking a fair bit about it. Um, you know, what, what do you have for us? Like I think we've... Uh, discussed it enough, we could move on to something else. But, uh, you know, God told us in Isaiah that um, his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not always our ways. And so uh, for, um, for us today and for the believers in Peter's day, God had Peter write some more about suffering. And that's what we're going to uh, look at this morning. And, and I think one of the things that uh, the Lord brought to remind me about that this week was this was like an, like an everyday reality for many believers in Peter's time, and of course it still is for many believers around the world today, that their decision to follow Christ could result in consequences. And, and I, um, I see Pastor Daryl back there, he's graciously not making a scene, uh, but we are having children's church this morning. Uh, and so if, you, if there's uh, any kids here that wanted to participate in that, Pastor Daryl's there at the back, and, uh, and you could head that way. But, um, Persecution for, for their faith was a real thing that they dealt with. It's a real thing that many Christians deal with today, even though we're not, we don't deal with it so much um, here in the United States. So we're going to read this passage together, and I believe the Lord has encouragement for us this morning. So uh, let's read this. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let no one suffer as a murderer or as a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone su suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for your word, and thank you that uh, you've given it to us to teach us, uh, to grow us, to guide us, and to lead us. And Lord, would you do those things as we study it this morning? And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so he says in verse 12, beloved, he's talking to uh, believers, ones that are loved by God and that are loved by Peter. And uh, he, he's got some more thoughts, and he says, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you. So the key word here for me is when. The fiery trial, when it comes. Not if it comes, but when it comes. So we should not be surprised when we experience difficult circumstances, uh, fiery trials, because you know, we're so often we're surprised, aren't we? Are you surprised? 
You know, you're like, okay, God, what are you, what are you doing? Like, I've been, I've been in the word every day this week. Like, our, my prayer, our prayer time's been so good, and I was reaching out to my neighbor, and like, now this? Like, I thought I was doing pretty good. Why is this coming upon me? And Peter says, don't be surprised when a fiery trial comes upon you. Um, you know, and I think our natural tendency is to seek comfort, right? Avoid discomfort and seek comfort, right? This, this, is the, this is the root of the fight over the thermostat in your house, right? Each one seeking their own comfort. We naturally want what is comfortable for us. But Peter says, don't be surprised when you face an uncomfortable situation, when you experience a fiery trial, he says. Um, and, and he says, it comes to test you, as children of God, loved by God, he says they're beloved, he says, you will experience fiery trials to test you. It's not a strange thing, it's to be expected. And of course, Jesus told his disciples a very similar thing in John chapter 15. Jesus told them, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are one of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, and therefore the world hates you. Remember the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Jesus was pretty straightforward with his disciples. He said, if they persecute me, they'll persecute you. Be ready for this. And so when Peter writes, don't be surprised at the fiery trials when it comes upon you to test you, um, that's a plain English instruction for us, but if you were a first century Christian reading these words, you would notice a word picture that Peter was trying to develop. And we talked a little bit about it, I think it was in October when we were in 1 Peter chapter one, and he, he said in, in verses one and six there, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. So we talked about it as a picture of a metalsmith uh, trying to determine the purity of the gold, the quality of the gold that he had. And, and when Peter writes here in verse 12, don't be surprised at the fiery trial, he says this, this word fiery is literally burning. And uh, it's the word that they would use when they, were, when they were describing a metalsmith who was heating up gold in a crucible or silver in a crucible to see uh, the quality of the gold. And uh, uh, the word is pyrosis. And it literally means the burning by which metals are roasted and reduced. So don't be surprised, beloved, when you are roasted and reduced. <laughs> Right, so that, that sounds like, ooh, this, is, this doesn't so, sound comfortable. Fiery trial, does, fiery trial doesn't sound comfortable, but roasted and reduced. So the metalsmith would pyrosis the metal, or he would refine the metal by putting it in a crucible and heating it up until it melted. And, and the purpose of this was not to destroy the metal, but to s test the quality of the metal. And uh, quite possibly if he's trying to purify the metal or refine it and remove some of the impurities off the top. So suffering for Christ is not meant to destroy us or to tear us down, but it is to purify us. So uh, Precept Austin commentary says this, in the ancient world, the silversmith would heat the silver ore in a clay crucible and would control the temperature of the fire with bellows. So the silversmith would control how much heat the metal had, making sure to never leave the fire unattended. As the ore heated up, impurities would rise to the surface and be skimmed off by the silversmith. The process was repeated until all impurities were removed. An end point he would determine had arrived when he could look into the silver and see his image reflected from the surface. And so this is a picture of what God uses fiery trials in our lives for. He wants to look into our lives and see the reflection of Christ. And in order to do that, sometimes in, some impurities have to be removed. Some sin has to be uh, taken off. And that, that 
God uses difficult circumstances or fiery trials that he says. Um, when, I, when we lived in Canada, I, did, I worked at a factory and I was in uh, quality control. And it was a plastics factory, we made everything. We would make the plastic and then that plastic would be molded into all kinds of car parts, to and canoes, to all kinds of things. So before anything was shipped out the door, a sample would come to quality control and we would test the plastic. And so we would uh, we'd check for the color, we would check hardness, uh, tensile strength, um, I had to write it down, I couldn't remember, melt temperature, flammability, um, all these different things we, te- we tested the plastic. So we would take the plastic, we, we would literally burn it in a crucible, uh, we would twist it, we would pull it, we would burn it, we would impact it. What was the purpose of doing it? Were we trying to destroy this plastic that we were getting ready to ship out? We wanted to ensure the quality of the plastic was made for the specification of the end user. And this is what God's doing to us. He does it when we experience a, a fiery trial, as Peter says, as we experience life difficulties sometimes. It's not to destroy us, but it is to make sure we are prepared for the purpose that God has for us. Ephesians 2.10 says he has prepared in advance good works for us to do. And so this, these trials that we experience is to prepare us for what he has for us to make us more like Christ, so that when he sees us, Christ's image is reflected back to him. So sometimes I do think we experience a a difficulty or a fiery trial because of our sin. Uh, Psalm 119.67, we looked at this a couple weeks ago on, uh, on a Wednesday night, says, before I was afflicted and went astray, but now I keep your word. So before I was afflicted, before I had a trial, before I had this difficulty, I was going astray, And then this affliction came, and now I obey your word. Sometimes I think God gives us trials for that. But these verses here, Peter's talking about suffering for doing what is right. Suffering for serving Jesus. Suffering for declaring his name. And um, and so this is the this is the um, this is the aspect. Sometimes we don't know. We don't know why we're in a difficult circumstance. We don't know why we're experiencing. Uh, hardship. Sometimes we do know. The question I think, more important question to ask is, Lord, what are you teaching me through this experience? It's more important than why is it happening? When is it going to end? What will the outcome be? But Lord, what are you trying to teach me during this time? Well, verse 13 and 14 says this, rejoice, talking about these fiery trials. It's not something strange, expect it to happen. And also rejoice as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed, when Christ returns. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, and listen to this, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And this is like countercultural, right? And this is a terrible circumstance. This is the worst week of my life. This is so difficult. Thank you, Jesus. Right? But being a Christian is countercultural. That's just the bottom line. Being a Christian is countercultural. Everyone's going one way, uh, we are going another way. And, and Paul instructed Timothy look, you're going to have to endure hardship like a good soldier. It's not rejoicing because this is fun and we're having a good time. We endured hardship, Paul says, but we also are to rejoice in that hardship. How does that work? I think the key here is right here at the end of verse 14, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. We can rejoice, we can be glad, we can, we're not enjoying the circumstances, but we can um, have joy because the spirit of the glory of God rests upon us. And I think by looking at some, some uh, biblical examples, we can kind of gain a picture of what does this mean, the spirit of, the, of glory and of God resting on us. Acts chapter four, these are all instances of people suffering uh, for following God in the scripture. So Acts four, verse 29, 31, uh, Peter and John were re- arrested for healing a man in Jesus' name. They were arrested, they were said, look, don't do that anymore, they were released. 
And so they, they gathered with, with uh, some of the believers and they were sharing what happened. And this was, the, this was the conclusion of their prayer. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. They said, Lord, you know what they did to us, but give us boldness to continue to proclaim your name. Where does that come from? That's the spirit of glory and of God resting on them, giving them the ability to continue. Was it a pleasant circumstance to be arrested, to be beaten, to be tried? No, but they were praying for boldness and God granted them their prayer. Acts chapter five, uh, verses 40 and 42, uh, Peter and some of the apostles were arrested. Uh, this was the situation where the, the, uh, they were miraculously released from prison and uh, they went straight back to the temple to, to teach. And so the guards, they woke in the morning, nobody was in jail, they were like, where are they? And they're like getting reports back that they're back in the public square teaching again. So they were arrested again, there was another hearing, they were beaten, and this is what, um, this is what it says. When they had called in the disciples, this was the, the, the Jewish leaders that had arrested them, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. They were rejoicing because they were counted worthy and with joy in the hearts and with, I, I think with passion, they just continue to preach Jesus' name. How are they able to do that? There's no explanation except that the Spirit of God was on them, empowering them to do what he had for them to do. Another example would be Stephen, on trial for preaching and for teaching. They, they pulled him out, they roughed him up, and uh, they're ready to stone him. And it says in Acts chapter seven, but he, which is Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. They killed him. How does a, a man being stoned to death, his last words, Lord, don't hold this against them. It's a supernatural Holy Spirit coming upon him and giving him the strength to go through this. We could talk about Paul and Silas. They were seized, falsely accused. They were beaten. They were thrown in jail. And what did they do? It says at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God. The prisoners were awake. They're hearing, of course, there was the earthquake. And they all took off because they didn't want to get beat again the next day, right? No, they saved the jailer's life. And they said to him, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. How did Peter, or excuse me, how did Paul and Silas Sing praises to God after being arrested, put on trial, beaten, bound, and thrown in jail. This has been a great day. Let's just cap it off by singing some praise hymns. The spirit of glory and of God was resting upon them. I've got one more, Moses. Hebrews chapter 11, 24 kind of gives us a, a bit of a summary of, of Moses. Of course, we know his story. He was being raised in Pharaoh's courts. And um, of course, not necessarily by a, um, an honorable way did he leave Pharaoh's courts, but he did leave Pharaoh's courts. And when he came back, he, he came back as the leader of the Israelites. But Hebrews 11 24 to 26 says, by faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. And I think this is the hang up for us uh, too often, choosing uh, too often we choose to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin than to suffer for the name of Jesus. But Moses made that trade because he was looking forward to the day when he would be with his God. First Peter here in uh, First Peter 4, 
verse 14. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. You say, well, I don't know that I could, I don't know how I would handle that situation. I don't know if I would be able to do what these men did. I don't know if I would really, what does God say? If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. It doesn't say it may rest upon you, it said it will rest upon you. Step out in faith and, 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 the, and God will not let us down. When you suffer for the sake of Christ, you experience the supernatural ministry of the Holy Spirit in a powerful way. There's no other explanation. Uh, here's a couple of verses that, that uh, uh, speak to this, the same idea. Psalm 73, 26. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Isaiah 40, 29 says, He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. God will give us the, the power to do the things he's called us to do. Verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Uh, an interesting, interesting verse. He goes from some pretty, pretty severe here, like from a murderer to a meddler. You know, and everybody in between. Don't suffer like a murderer does. Don't suffer for doing wrong. And he, he says, um, if you are to suffer, verse 16 says, suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. This, this word uh, meddler, I think a murderer, we know what a murderer is, we know what a thief is, we know what an evildoer is, someone who's just doing what's wrong, someone who's getting in trouble with the law, but what is a meddler? And so the definition of this word meddler might say a, a busybody in your translation, someone who acts like a supervisor when they are not the supervisor. <laughs> Anybody know a meddler? <laughs> if you've got brothers or sisters, one of you is probably the meddler, right? There's a meddler in every family. Um, but don't suffer like a murderer or a thief or an evildoer as a, or as a meddler. Like we, we looked at that earlier. Peter says, if you suffer for doing wrong, don't be surprised. That's the, that's the logical outcome of, of doing what's wrong. And Peter says here again, if, if anyone, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, so if you suffer for your faith, don't be ashamed, but glorify God in that name. There's no, there's no reward for suffering for doing what's wrong, getting what you do, but when you suffer um, uh, for Christ, don't be ashamed, but glorify in God. Sometimes we just wanna ask that question though, right? Well, God, why am I suffering for, for doing what's right as a Christian, and why do I see murderers and thieves and evildoers and meddlers and they're not suffering? Couple of thoughts on that. You're actually being a meddler, right? You're trying to supervise someone else's wrongdoings and correct it. Okay, so we're already told not to do that. Uh, we've got to stay in our lane, take care of what, take care of ourselves first. But then also do, do what Jesus did. And Peter told us what Jesus did. He entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And then the third thing I, I would encourage you to do this week, if this is something you've been thinking about recently, read Psalm 73, right? It, it, this, is a, this is exactly what Psalm 73 is dealing with. David saying, look, I see these people and it, and it, and it upsets me. And, uh, and God, God deals with him with that, Psalm 73, good read. So, okay, how do we, how do, we do this though? Um, look at verse 16 with me. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but glorify. How do we glorify God when we're suffering? Well, when the Spirit of God's resting on us because we are suffering for his sake, we'll be able to glorify him. We acknowledge that he's in control of all things and we thank him for the circumstance we find ourselves in, even if it's not a favorable circumstance, and we ask him, Lord, what are you trying to teach me in this situation? 
Verse 17 says, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? As we look at this first, we realize that the context here is suffering for what's doing right. Um, With the purpose, not because God's trying to punish us, uh, but because God loves us and he's trying to conform us to the image of Christ, be more like Christ every day. This is, this is, the, this is the, um, the context leading up to this verse that says it is time for judgment to begin at the, ho- at the household of God. And so God's using suffering as part of that process of judgment. Not judgment to condemn us, but to purify us, to refine us, to make us more like Christ. And if, if this is a, um, a difficult thing for us, What will be the outcome for those who have, as it says here, who do not obey the gospel of God, who have rejected God's plan for their life? It's a sobering thought. If if God brings trials into our lives and we don't like those trials and we're not comfortable with them, but he's doing it because he loves us and he's refining us and he's making us more like Christ, what will be the outcome of God's judgment of someone who has rejected God? Of course, we know the ultimate uh, destination for someone who rejects the gospel is hell. And that's not, a, that's not a pleasant thought. If the righteous is scarcely saved, verse 18 says, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Um, kind of uh, sort of repeating the same thought, verse 17 and 18, sort of a, almost just a repeat with different words. He's quoting from pro- uh, Proverbs here in verse 18. If the righteous is scarcely saved, what would become of the ungodly and the sinner? Uh, this, this, this little phrase, scarcely saved, could be translated, saved with difficulty. And so then I, of course, raise the question, well, what does that mean? Um, two things it doesn't mean, and then two things I think that it does mean. Uh, it doesn't mean that if we work really, really, really hard and we're really, really, really good, we might just make it into heaven. Like we just barely make it in, all right? It's all through the scripture, that t- kind of teaching would be rejected. Um, it doesn't mean that Jesus' death was just barely enough to get us into heaven. Jesus' sacrifice was the ultimate sacrifice, um, without question was enough, and again, scripture would um, teach that in, in, uh, all throughout scripture. Uh, and so we, wouldn't, we, we couldn't take this one verse or these two verses and try to teach that scripture refutes that. Uh, so I do think there are two things that Peter's talking about here. Is one, um, again, in the context of suffering, suffering's a, a Christian reality. Fiery trials, um, testing our faith. This is, this is part of what we will experience as Christians. Um, and, and the early readers were, were experiencing this fact that their decision to follow Christ came with great difficulty. And so when he says, if the righteous are, are saved with difficulties, you could say, you could translate it that way, he's, he's just acknowledging that the Christian life is not all um, ice cream and brownies. I think the second part of it comes from Jesus' teaching. Um, Jesus would say uh, to his disciples in Matthew chapter 19, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, well, who could be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Uh, So in these verses, is Jesus saying to us, well, it's difficult, but a rich man could make it to heaven because of his richness and his wealth and his goodness. It's difficult, but he could do it. And he's saying, well, no, a rich man can't make it. No one can make it apart from the grace of God. With, with God, all things are possible. Impossible with man, but with God, all things are possible. When we humble ourselves then, and we acknowledge that we're a sinner, then we can receive the grace that God has for us. We say, I can't do this on my own, I need you, Jesus. Another passage Jesus talks about it is Matthew chapter seven, when he tells uh, his disciples and the people, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. 
But the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. So what's Jesus teaching? The only way to heaven is through Jesus. Peter said it, said it in Acts, there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Narrow is the way Jesus taught. And it is hard because the decision to follow Christ means that we will have temporary hardships here on this earth, but we have a great eternal reward that we look forward to. So again, if this is the way that a righteous person is saved, it's impossible for a man to be saved by himself, only by the grace of God. With God it's possible, by his grace. What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Well, we've already, we've already talked about that. Their future is destruction. Therefore, this is, uh, this is Peter's con- kind of his conclusion to this subject of suffering. Let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Because we've been saved by God's grace, because we have escaped this eternal uh, destination of hell by the grace of God, when we suffer for God's will, we can entrust ourselves to him. He, was our, he is our creator, he is our savior. When we're doing good, we can entrust ourselves to him. His spirit will come upon us and give us everything that we need. In Hebrews it says, in uh, Hebrews 12 too, that we are to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Here's, here's Jesus, it says, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Was the cross joy? No, he endured the cross. What was the joy? We're the joy. He endured the cross for us. He despised the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus' victory over sin for you, for me, came through his suffering on the way to the cross. Now he's seated at the right hand of the Father and we look forward to the day when we will be in heaven with him. We're not promised an easy life. Some people get a pretty easy life. Others face great difficulty. When we are saved, it's not like drawing the, um, what's, uh, what's, the uh, what's the game? Monopoly. It's not like drawing the, the card in Monopoly. Advance to go, collect 200. You know, just free pass. We're gonna bypass all life difficulties. We're just gonna uh, be zapped up into heaven. It's all be over. That's not what we're promised. But we are promised that God will be with us every step of the way. Paul told the Corinthians, we do not lose heart. Though our outer selves is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction that's the fiery trial, it's a light and momentary affliction, is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen, the things of this world, are temporary. But the things that are unseen are eternal. This is a, this is a great conclusion that Peter writes. For those who suffer according to God's will, not for doing what's wrong, but for loving God, for serving God, for proclaiming his name, entrust your soul to a faithful creator. He's the one who made us. Where better off are we but in his hands, following his will for our lives. We're gonna conclude this morning by, by uh, singing a song. Um, I, I said to Mildred this week, oh, it's an old song. It's not that old, it's 30 years old, Mildred, I looked it up. It was written by a Canadian, so maybe some of you know it, maybe some of you don't. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna ask you to do, th- do something here when we, Peter's gonna play this song for us. We've been talking about the fiery trials. When we sing this song, um, Refiner's Fire, I think is the name of it. We've been talking about what that means to be in the refiner's fire. 
to be in the crucible. We're not talking about a pleasant, joyful, uh, ice cream and brownies social. We're talking about suffering for standing up for Jesus, suffering for proclaiming his name, suffering for serving him. This is the refiner's fire that we're about to sing, sing about. So if you can sing these words, knowing that when, when, when you say refiner's fire, you're not talking about a pleasant circumstance. You're talking about a difficulty that you may face for the sake of Christ, but that you are willing to do it, knowing that the spirit of glory will rest upon you. This is what we're singing about. So be careful as you sing. Just listen if that's not what you want to sing about this morning. That'd be all right too. Um, but if you've got something that you want to uh, pray about, Mike and Dion Brown are going to be up here. They would love to uh, talk about the trial that you're facing, pray with you, encourage you with that. Um, but we're going to just conclude with this, with this song. And uh, I would just ask that you would be careful as you sing these words. Don't sing a lie this morning. But sing these words if that's the truth of your heart. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, that you you love us so much not to just leave us the way that we are. You wouldn't just let us go our own way, uh, Lord, but your desire is that we would reflect the image of Christ in our life. And Lord, sometimes what's necessary to do that is to uh, turn up the heat a little bit so that the impurities could be skimmed off and we would be prepared for the good works that you have for us. Lord, I pray uh, that as we consider these things this morning, that we would uh, really be serious uh, in taking inventory of what it means uh, to be a follower of Christ. And are we, are we willing to uh, temporarily suffer discomfort uh, for your name's sake? Lord, we know that we have an eternity awaiting us. Lord, we know that those who don't know your name also have an eternity awaiting them. If, if you're here this morning and you've if you never put your faith in Christ, in Jesus as your Savior, what a great morning to do that this morning. Mike and Dion would love to talk to you and pray with you about that. One of the pastors would love to talk to you and pray with you that, about that. It's just as simple as saying, Lord, I am a sinner. I know that I deserve hell, but I also know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And you just have to believe that. You put your faith and your trust in him. He'll change your life and give you the opportunity to live for him. You could do that this morning. Father, for those who are are facing difficulty, um, Lord, maybe we're just here this morning saying, Lord, I'm willing to serve you. I'm willing to declare your name, no matter the outcome. Lord, would you prepare us for for difficulty when we do that? Satan doesn't want you to have uh, victory in individuals' lives, and so that's partly where this difficulty comes from. But Lord, Would you refine us? Would you purify us? Would you make us more and more like your son? Lord, thank you for your word that guides us and teaches us. May we walk in the truth that we've heard this morning. I pray in Jesus' name.